we're all showing our vulnerability together. You're looking into people's homes. You're seeing their kids burst into the room. You're seeing the cat walk over the laptop. And it all suddenly feels very human and informal. And we've cut through an awful lot of, I suppose, of our former business practices, which would have been a lot more formal by nature in the past. Hello, you're very welcome to All In Business, your weekly business show here on Joe, backed by AIB. Well, last week saw me sitting solo in the studio. This week, we've obviously had to go one step further on the old isolation front now that we're all in lockdown. I'm coming to you live from my bedroom this morning while my guests will be joining me digitally to talk about the COVID-19 emergency and the anxiety we may all be feeling as a result now that the line between our home life and our work life has been blurred or effectively removed altogether. We'll be talking to Ashling Tayar, the CEO of Tandem HR Solutions, and Dr. Mali Coyne, a clinical psychologist and NUIG lecturer. Meanwhile, our trailblazer is Keanu Flaherty. You may remember he was with us not so long ago talking about his company, Safecility. But as we all know, a lot has changed in the world since then. Now he's also the founder of Feed the Heroes, an organization doing exactly as the name suggests, feeding healthcare staff on the front lines as they work to protect the rest of us from COVID. Don't forget to hit subscribe to get the full show on podcast and YouTube each week so that you never miss an episode. And you'll also find us on social media. We're on LinkedIn and Twitter with the hashtag All In Business. Joe presents All In, together with AIB, backing Irish business. Ashling and Mali, thank you so much uh, for joining me today from your respective locations. Um, I'm going to jump straight in. Um, Some people are on day three or four of the lockdown at this point, but some of us like myself are on week five of working from home. So cabin fever is very much starting to creep in. Um, From the feedback both of you are hearing, is this the case across the board? Is everybody really feeling the corona anxiety um, and how should we be dealing with it if so? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it's really, really difficult um, for many people in all circumstances, I think. Um, I think people who are trying to work from home and trying to parent at the same time are having real issues. I think older people who aren't allowed to leave their houses, it's very difficult for them. Um, it's, It's very difficult for people who don't have kids. I think it's very difficult for every single layer of society. This is unprecedented and what's happened. And I think it's a really difficult coping. It's a really difficult thing to cope with because the usual mechanisms we have to cope with life have literally been stripped from us. And um, it's just very, very hard to manage. Um, But obviously there's nice moments too. But um, certainly for me, I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm working from home a lot of the time. And I'm finding the balance very uh, hard uh, with kind of minding my children as well and everything else. What about you, Ashling? And, and how has your business been affected as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it, look, these are really challenging times for everybody. And, you know, I'm juggling the, the homeschooling, the parenting and trying to run a business. So, so it is tricky times. But I have to say, I think what I am seeing a lot of is a real forthcoming of humanity in all of this. And even when I'm talking to clients and so on, they're absolutely suffering cabin fever. And a lot of our clients would be European based. So they've been locked down for quite a while now with really restrictive measures like needing a warrant to get outside their homes, only being allowed out once a day, you know, so even more restrictive than us in Ireland here. But what's interesting is how human we've all become over technology like Zoom and Skype. And, you know, while people are missing the canteen moments and the coffee chats and, you know, the water cooler moments that you get in your day, what I've started to see is an awful lot of rise in in these practices happening, but just happening through technology. So like people having buddy Zoom chats with each other, buddy coffee. You know, I had a Zara and Zinfandel night the other night with a friend, you know, so people are finding new ways to connect. And I think that's just the human spirit, isn't it? Regardless of how challenging everything is, that people find the humanity in it. And I find work practices softening up an awful lot and people being, you know, because we're all showing our vulnerability together. You're looking into people's homes. 
you're seeing their kids burst into the room, you're seeing the cat walk over the laptop and it all suddenly feels very human and informal and we've cut through an awful lot of, I suppose, of our former business practices, which would have been a lot more formal by nature in the past. And as a CEO, Ashling, what steps have you taken to, to kind of tap into the personal lives of your professional colleagues or your staff, I suppose, and to help keep them sane? Yeah, yeah. So we we did a couple of things straight away that I think have served us well. So the first thing we said is, okay, let's stop everything we're doing and think about how can Tandem be a force for good right now. Let's forget about all of our sales and marketing campaigns because they're all out the window and everything we plan to do, because we we grow our business a lot through conferences and engagements and speaking opportunities and so on. And none of that's on the table. So <clears throat> let's just forget about everything we did and throw it all out and start with a blank sheet of paper and think about our customers first. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so we started to write up a guide to help our customers. And it was really based around our experience because we've been managing remotely uh, our team for about four years now. And we were kind of a little bit more used to homework and practices, flexible work and living life through Zoom, all that kind of stuff that, that I guess everybody's been accelerated into now. So we were like, well, let's just share all of our experiences and see if it can be helpful. So we got on to all of our customers. We gave them a little guide um, and we saw really amazing results. We actually saw a surge in usage on the platform with our existing customers. And it was lovely. It was these lovely moments of even play, even Italy, for example, is one of, one of our client customers. They started to use feedback more on tandem. So they were giving each other feedback for being courageous. They were giving each other feedback to encourage one another. So they started to connect with each other in different ways using our platform. And our platform was always designed to give each other feedback, but we never had this in mind, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was starting to be used as a way to reach each other and be a community together. And I think we started to build on that. And then we said, well, look, you know what, we've just built Pulse Surveys and we hadn't even launched it to the market. And we were like, let's just give it for free. And um, let's let people use it because they need to check in with their people. They need to see how they're doing. Um, and we had one uh, one of our clients who has a huge engagement survey at this time, which would be about 30 questions on the organization, trust, leadership. And they said, no, we're just going to do a really quick survey on COVID-19. How are you feeling? Are you feeling resilient? You know, what can we do to help? <coughs> Excuse me. And um, and I think this is one of the impacts. I'm losing my voice because I'm talking so much over Zoom these days. But, um, but so, so I think there's been good moments for us as a team to see that actually we hold some relevance, that this is not some, you know, trinket tool that doesn't matter, that actually it's helping people connect each other. We had a lovely moment last week where one of the CEOs of one of our client companies stood up and really showed vulnerability, like stood up and, 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 and said in front of his whole organization, this is unprecedented. I'm trying to navigate my way through here, but I'm probably not getting everything right. You know, just give me feedback on tandem. Tell me if there's things I should be doing. And that's such a lovely moment of leadership that shows vulnerability, that shows empathy, and people really rallied behind it. So I think despite all the awful things that's happening in business, there are wonderful moments shooting through, which is really cutting through the old world and bringing us into a whole different way of how we interact as organizations. And I think, you know, it's time to reinvent all of that. And, and there's optimism in that. So so we're just trying to we connect every morning as a team to check in on each other and to say hi and just get each other started for the day. And uh, there is just some lovely human moments in that that we wouldn't have taken time to do otherwise. So new practices, I think, are emerging that are a lot more human than how we would have worked in the past. Um, so some nice stories of uh, personal and professional resilience uh, there from you, Ashling Mali. Are you are you seeing or hearing similar? Um, and for anyone, maybe another CEO, maybe watching this, looking to to boost um, resilience among their own teams, would you have any advice on how to go about doing that? Well, I suppose resilience is all about um, facing a manageable threat and having somebody there to help you with that threat. That's what resilience is. And that's what's going to build resilience over time. And some of us may not have thought that we would be able to cope with it. Like if you said this to us two months ago, even that in 2020, you're going to have this situation 
we might have thought we were we were not going to be able to cope with something like this. So it's quite incredible that we are coping and all of them what Ashling is saying there about the way people are adapting is incredibly and, and and the humanity that's out there. And I suppose stress does give us I wrote an article in the Irish Independent about how compassion and calm are are contagious too. And what stress does is it gives us access to our hearts. So when we are stressed as human beings, we don't only release adrenaline and cortisol, which are the stress chemicals. We also release oxytocin, which is our cuddle love hormone. So when we're stressed, we actually look to other people to help us with that stress. So we're, we're really human and, and social animals. Molly, you mentioned um, adrenaline versus oxytocin there, but um, I suppose it's a bit more difficult for people being flooded with um the cuddle hormone when they're in lockdown, maybe in an apartment on their own. Um, I suppose that's when self-care starts to get important. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it can be harder sometimes for us to be kind to ourselves. It's easier to be kind to other people. And, and that's what humans find. And that's just a kind of a natural way that humans are. We all have this little voice inside our heads that says, you're not doing well enough. You should be working more today. Why aren't you able to to get this work-life balance going? And like I have found it as a parent and as a worker incredibly hard the last few weeks to actually get stuff done. But I suppose the self-kindness aspect is something that, you know, I think employers, it's important for them to be looking at that with their employees and checking in with them about how they're managing to kind of achieve this balance between doing things that are achievable each day and balancing that with pleasure and with closeness and connection. And as you said, of course, it's harder to cuddle people when you're in an apartment and you're 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 stuck in there on your own. It's about, as Ashleen said, finding alternative ways to do that. Um, but there are lovely self-compassion practices out there where you you kind of try to kind of calm your stress response by a kind of you know, using the principles of compassion, which are common humanity, which is we're all in this together. Um, we've never really had a situation where the whole human, you know, in the last, I don't know, as far as I remember, where all of humanity is facing this together, where none of us are alone in this. We're all in this together and using the idea of mindfulness, which is accepting our feelings and being in the present moment without judging ourselves. If you're having a really hard moment, it's OK, because this is a really hard time for people. And then that self-kindness, which is kind of putting your hand on your heart and saying, this is really hard right now, but I'm going to get through this. I'm going to ring somebody. I'm going to let my manager know I'm struggling. It's all about communication. And as Ashleen said, you know, every morning checking in with your staff and, you know, trying to kind of boost their morale and asking for feedback, because this is unprecedented. You know, managers don't really know how to cope with this either. And they're trying their best. And in terms of the amount of causes of anxiety at the moment, so we've got fear about, you know, cabin fever and and lockdown being stuck at home. We've got fear about contracting corona if you don't have it already. Um, But then people have an awful lot of anxiety about um, either their businesses, if they own one, or their jobs, if they work for one. So there's an awful lot of anxiety on the plate here. Yeah, there's there. There absolutely. um, There is an awful lot of anxiety. And I suppose a really important thing to kind of look at is how, you know, how much control you have over a situation in a moment. So, yes, um, you know, you might be feeling when, when we look at worry, it's good to divide it up between something that you can do something about now and whether that's a real worry or something that's kind of more like catastrophizing a situation that hasn't happened yet. And that's where we kind of talk about trying to limit the amount of news that you're watching and trying to build in that balance of pleasure in your life and connection with other people so that you're not constantly watching stuff about the coronavirus and, you know, ju- you know, making it worse for yourself. I suppose we, we need to balance where we all we have three kind of systems and one our threat system is very much kind of um activated at the moment. And so therefore, we very much need to balance that with our soothing, calming system, which is about connection with other people and being kind to ourselves. Okay, good points there. Um, Ashling, I just wanted to ask you in terms of businesses, what do you think the new normal is going to be? Um, 
can we go back to exactly what we had or mm. will it be a different version of it? Yeah, no, I, I, th- I think we can't go back. And, and I think a lot of people don't want to go back because I think this moment is such a moment for pause and reflection. And a lot of people are looking back going, do you know what? We didn't have it that right anyway. Do you know, it wasn't like the lifestyles we were living were so hectic. We were living in our phones. We had very little time. We're all suffering these horrible commute times. You know, there was an awful lot wrong as it was. And everyone's now been accelerated into this future of work zone where we don't work like that anymore. And they're kind of going, actually, maybe it wasn't that good. And maybe this is the way we should be working time to time. Obviously, we don't all want to be locked down forever. But I I was talking to a CEO of a very large company uh, who were very reliant on it during this crisis. And he was saying, somebody who'd never worked from home before, you know, just was very much the office guy, very much, uh, you know, enjoys the interaction with people and so on. And he's like, I'm never going back to a five day week. You know, I'm going to work from home two days a week going forward. And I think that's what you're going to see. I think people are going to come back and they're going to be more demanding about what they want out of life. Because if this does anything for us, it gives us moment for pause and for reflection and for thinking about when I get back out there, it's going to be different and I'm going to do these things and I'm going to enjoy my life more. And a lot of people getting that time with their family going, actually, I was sacrificing too much time with my family. You know, I, I and even personally, I, I, I kind of have readjusted my whole perspective of how I was living my life. But I think that's the the moment for organizations. And I love your your thoughts about kindness and 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 how now is the time for people to connect and reach out as a community, because I think now is the time to reinvent all those practices that maybe weren't all that kind to begin with. Like if you think about HR directors right now, they're getting ready for interim performance reviews. Could you imagine telling somebody in a check, one of the checkout girls in any of the supermarkets or, or guys in any of the supermarkets or one of the delivery guys or guy in a warehouse or whoever it is, could you t- imagine telling them that they've fully met expectations this year? Like, it just feels all wrong, right? You know, they were li- risking their health, their family's health just to turn up every day. Like, that is far beyond met expectations. And yet 70% of your organization naturally fall into one of those rating categories or something that sounds something like that. So you have to look at all of our practices and go, actually, maybe they weren't that kind to begin with. And maybe we need to rethink them. Now, I'm not saying everyone should go and throw everything out overnight. But I think there is an opportunity to readjust our processes and think about them through a new lens and think about how do we run our working lives, our working processes, and whether these processes are going to serve us well in the future. Because I think there's no going back. I think there's only a reinvention uh, for the future. And that one, I think, looks a lot more exciting than the lives we were living. You're so full of positivity, Ashling, and it's wonderful. (laughs) And I don't want to be the person to come in and burst the bubble with a negative question. And yet I'm going to. Go for it. (laughs) <laughs> it strikes me that um, an awful lot of what you're saying, obviously I agree with, but an awful lot of it um, is down to the personality of the manager or the, the CEO or the boss, whatever, in charge. Um, and that a mindset change has to very much be from the top down. Um, apparently, you know, we're told that most likely a, a pretty big recession is going to come on the back of this. Mm-hmm. That can cause its own panic. So I would think that while a lot of people would be thinking like you um, and, and like Mally said, would be a lot of bosses would probably be coming back to the office uh, full of the cuddle hormone and and just ready to tell everyone they're amazing. But a lot might be coming back more panic stricken than ever going, yeah. I barely have a business to survive. I might be coming down on people harder. Do you think that's something we might have to deal with? And how do you change that mindset from the top down, if so? Yeah, I think I think people will come back going, we need to reinvent our businesses. And that might mean all sorts of things. That might mean layoffs. That might be mean downsizing. It might mean de-layering. It could mean a thousand different combinations for a thousand different businesses. And I think people have to get realistic that the old world doesn't exist anymore. But you can only control what what's within your sphere of influence. And you can only um, sort of readjust and reinvent what, what's possible for you. But that means everybody gets to reinvent, right? But so it's not just the CEO coming back and going, OK, I have to strip out 50 percent of the cost base here because I'm facing a recession. There's lots of different ways of doing that. And for sure, people are part of that. 
But every time those things happen, and I've been in that position before of laying people off and, and, and making people redundant, and it's a, it's a horrible, stressful situation to be in. But you often see it's also the trigger where people completely reinvent their lives and you meet them a year down the track and they're 10 times happier than they were to begin with, you know, in, in the old world. So so while there is an end to the old and that might bring sadness and stress and, and, and that, and it isn't all positive, you're absolutely right. I think there's the beginning of the new and that's what we have to focus on is how do we reinvent ourselves in that and how do we reinvent the workplace? And I think HR in particular have a massive role to play here because the people who do stay with you, however diminished they are, they have to be 100 percent engaged to get your business back up on its feet again. You know, so there's no point in kind of carrying a workforce who are all, you know, completely disengaged and thinking we've been treated badly here. And, you know, so when we do these things, we have to do them in a very authentic and human way. And even if that is layoffs or redundancies, like I was reading an article yesterday where hundreds of people were laid off on a Zoom call and, and it was very cold and half the people missed the Zoom call. So they found out through Zoom chat. And, right. you know, there's a way to do these things. And I think it's it's every point of everything we do from here on in. We have to think what is the most human, kind way that we can do this, even if it is tough, even if it is, you know, difficult for us to take mm -hmm. on there is a yeah. way that you can still be kind. And I think that's the important piece from here. Okay. And Mally, what do you think about that balance between, as Ashling said, I guess, empathy versus efficiency? How can managers fix that in their minds, I guess? I agree with Ashling. I think there's a way of, of balancing the two. I think we're kind of, we're facing into an unknown entity. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. We don't know how people are going to be affected. Um, there is, I think there is a way of bringing empathy into management. And I think we're seeing, like even in, in terms of my own job, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot more I, humanity brings out your empathy. That's what happens. So you become more empathic when you see, the, you know, those videos of, you know, those funny videos that are going around at the moment. I suppose you kind of become more, you're like, oh, yeah, well, that that's me as well. You know, we're, we're all kind of more human. So I, I'm hoping that... Um, you know, when things go back to normal, well, normal, whatever that means, um, that, that, you know, I, I, I guess, I mean, not every manager is going to be, is going to have that in them, but hopefully there will be more kind of push from the employees for them to want that in their lives, for them to maybe want a little bit more balance in their lives where maybe a day a week they can work from home or they can kind of incorporate looking after for their children sometimes as well or not doing as many um, kind of foreign trips if they feel like it's impacting on their lives. I definitely feel there is a silver lining in all of this and it's an opportunity for us to even take a step back and kind of go, what are our values? I mean, true happiness comes from actually happiness or contentment comes from actually like, you know, following, looking at what are your values and then, you know, your values might be family and they might be like achievement in a particular thing and, you know, humour. Well, if you actually live your life according to those values, you will be more content and more happy. So it might give us a chance to take a step back and figure out what are our values and are we actually working according to them? I, I remember working on a, the stress documentary a few years ago on RTE and, you know, it was very much, you know, with this particular volunteer, it was very much looking at what were his values. He was very work based. He was like, when I have all this money, then I'll be happy when I have this then I'll be happy. And maybe we're realizing now that, you know, reaching that unattainable, reaching that or trying to like reach it, like as if we're going around on a, on a, on a wheel is not necessarily going to do us good. We kind of have to think about what we have control over right now. And, to, you know, so I guess, you know, living a court, taking a step back and figuring out what your values are and trying to live according to them. And I hope that maybe employees will vote with their feet. And if they're not happy in their particular company, that they would maybe make that move themselves later on. But there's no doubt that there's a lot of hardship for people out there. And I don't want to underestimate that for people who've lost their jobs, 
for people who are watching, you know, like my dad lives in Spain. You know, I've, I lived in Italy. I lived in Milan before. I know these and I have a brother in Poland, a sister in Belgium. I know these countries. I, you know, I lived around the, lots of different countries when I was younger. And to watch those scenes of people really struggling and it is very, um, I, I find that really quite difficult to kind of, mm. It's hard to talk about that and the silver lining at the same time, if you know what I mean. I, I try to kind of marry those up in my head, but we're, we're, we still don't know yet how the crisis is going to hit Ireland, really. Um, so I guess it, it's just difficult. And I don't want to downplay that for people who are really, really struggling out there. Well, we're almost out of time, but I want to squeeze in one last question uh, directly to each of you. So um, we're, we're on you at the moment, Molly, so we'll stick with you. Um, yeah. I've seen a lot of commentary about the similarity to war times and just, just even in terms of the, the joking side of that, you know, your your ancestors or, or the generations before you were called on to go to war, you're being called on to sit on the couch and watch Netflix, so so do it. Um is this a wartime men mentality and is, is it a similar psychology, Mali, um, you know, in terms of a global crisis as it would be if there was a war on? I think there are aspects of it that are very similar to warlike conditions in terms of lockdown and not being able to go places that, you know, to travel freely and not to be able to kind of have your, you know, to have your freedom taken from you. Also, you know, like you have this kind of unknown um, kind of predator, if you want to call it that way. And, you know, we don't know when we come home from wherever we've gone. You know, there's this whole kind of like, oh, God, I have to clean my shoes. I have to clean this. I have to do this. And you're trying to kind of fight an unknown enemy. And it's very difficult in that way. But at the same, and I think there will be a lot of trauma after this, for sure. As a psychologist, I'm fully expecting that children, families, adults, older people, there's going to be a lot of people to help during this, but probably more even after this to kind of figure out how it's affected them and for them to, you know, because we've just gone into this without even knowing it was going to happen. But at the same time, we don't have like the threat of somebody bombing us, for instance, or, you know, kind of like it, it's, it's different in that sense. You know, I think we probably have a bit more control at the moment. We have technology that can connect us. We're kind of in a it's the way you view it. I mean, somebody I've been seeing loads of jokes, but also loads of amazing things online that talk about you know, rather than seeing this as a kind of like a time where you're locked down to kind of see it as a time where you're kind of safely cocooned or you're safely kind of, you know, you, you have your choice to be safe at home. So that is kind of how you're fighting the war and how you're being compassionate to your fellow human beings is to be at home and stay at home and follow the guidelines. So I, I think there are similarities to wartime, but there's also differences. But I think there will be, unfortunately, trauma resulting from this. And I think the way we manage this on a daily basis now, how we support each other, how we support ourselves, how we look after ourselves every day is going to be the difference between whether how traumatic this is in the long term. OK, great. And um, that's kind of what I expected you to say, but it's it's nice and okay. reassuring <laughs> to hear a, a clinical psychologist say it all the same. Um, and Ashing, my, my last question for you Um it strikes me, actually, even from the three of us on this call at the moment, it strikes me that the three of us are involved in, um, I guess, the soft skill industry in a way. There's been so much focus um, and drive behind oh, data analytics and data science and, and the tech side of things for so long. Um, and, you know, we've got a clinical psychologist uh, whose job, I suppose, is to care about people. Um, my job is essentially to talk to people and Ashling, yours is the HR side of things and, and to make sure people are OK in a workforce. Yeah. Are we about to witness the rise of the soft skill industry once more? Are soft skills and people with soft skills about to kind of step back up um, to the front lines in a sense when this is all over? I think so. Yeah, I, I think there's a real opportunity for, um, I mean, HR is at the heart of this. They've never been so important in the organization. They're being called on left, right and center to um, support employees, come up with new plans, rethink how we connect with them, rethink how we can make it a better community for them. 
all that kind of stuff. And I think that's not going to stop. In fact, I think it's going to accelerate because when people come back, you're going to have twofold. You're going to have the part, the the employees coming back with greater demands going why can't we telework? Why do we have to work nine to five? Why can't we work in more flexible hours, flexible zones? So they're going to be more demanding. And also the managers who need an awful lot of help, because if you think about all the managers who maybe in the past might have controlled through presenteeism or micromanagement, like they're at sea right now. They need a whole new toolkit for how do we manage people going forward? Because we can never manage them in that way again. And they're the managers who are really struggling. Like I've heard some awful uh, stories of managers trying to manage their way through this with their old practices. And it's just not working. You can't work off ringing everybody every few minutes going, what are you doing now? You know, it doesn't work. So so giving them new tools and new skills so that they can manage this new world order where people want greater empowerment and freedom and flexibility and, and being able to help them with your practices. I think, I think HR have a massive role to play. And I do think it, it is the time for soft skills to play a much bigger role in organizations. And we have the platform now to do it, too, because I think the problem in the past was there was no burning platform. Right. Everybody talked about the future of work and soft skills for years. But, you know, cost always won the day or profits or, you know, but but now actually you have a burning platform where businesses can't function without these processes, without community coming together. So, yeah, I think you're you're dead right. I, th- I think there's a whole new era ahead of us. And uh, it, it allows, I suppose, soft skills and humanity to rise in the workplace an awful lot more than it has done in the past. Well, I'm going to leave it there, uh, ladies. Thank you so much for being with me remotely. And I have to say that has been a really uplifting 30 minute <laughs> conversation. You're both so positive. Uh, long may it continue. Um, and I suppose I'm pro- this is it's not like this situation is going anywhere. So I'm sure I'll speak to you both again in the coming weeks. But uh, stay safe in the meantime. Thank you. Too. Lovely Thank meet you, Ashlyn. Bye. You too. Next up is a man who's managed to raise half a million euro in just two weeks to feed frontline workers tackling the coronavirus. It's Feed the Heroes founder, Keanu Flaherty. Kian, thank you so much for being with us this morning, remotely, of course. Um, strange times we live in when uh, we're both we're both communicating from, well, I don't know about you, but I'm in my bedroom at the moment. So this is certainly <laughs> the strangest interview I've ever done. But uh, the last time we spoke to you, Kian, was about a very different subject matter. We were talking about facility and IoT and many other things. But um, I guess if you want something done right, ask a busy person, they say, or a busy person. And now you're also the founder of Feed the Heroes. So tell us tell us about Feed the Heroes and where did the idea come from? Yeah, absolutely. I took on a second job because uh, being at home was was that difficult a thought to deal with. Um, I, it was about two weeks ago now, just over two weeks, uh, a Sunday, sort of sitting on the couch and scrolling through Twitter. And I saw a tweet re- into my timeline from the Matter ED. Uh, a team there had been given a, an anonymous donation of a takeaway, but the impact it seemed to have on them was enormous. Um, I was sitting here kind of doing what we're told, socially distancing. I thought I wouldn't mind doing something like that. And I'm sure there was a few people who would feel the same way. Um, so, so I set up a GoFundMe and said, maybe if we raise, you know, a couple of hundred euros or maybe a thousand euros, we might have a couple of uh, drops of, of pizzas or something. Um, and I swear, Yvonne, within hours, it had just taken off. The, the people uh, who were out there had a very different idea for how big this should get. Um, and it's just been a whirlwind since then. It's crazy that you say, you know, it's been two weeks because um, m- maybe it's just indicative of how tuned into the internet and Twitter and everything else we all are now that there's nothing else to do. But I feel like I've been seeing, uh, you know, headlines like Kino Flaherty, feature <laughs> founder, for about a year. Um, Sorry about Kian, that. Kian, tell me, um, in terms of the actual, so you got the funding, It all that all came together pretty fast um, over the two weeks. And once you had the funding far more than you expected, of course, um, what was the next step? How does it work practically and logistically in terms of where does the food come from? How do you get it to wherever you decide it's going? How do you decide where it's going? How does it work? Yeah, the first first day and second day was just uh, really quick. You know, let's turn this around and, and try and get something back out to show people that we're um, serious about doing what we said we'd do on the GoFundMe page. So, you know, you start with um, 
maybe someone reaches out to you on Twitter and says, oh, we're in this location. You're like, okay, well, you know, we have now got money and we'll, we'll ring a takeaway that's near them and let's send something in. And the first number of drops were, were that, you know, just sort of unstructured, just um, trying to kind of lift people's spirits uh, across a Saturday, Sunday and a Monday. Um, but very quickly, we had to take on uh, a team. Um, my own team from Safe Cility are, are on this on a voluntary basis. My own, um, a, a number of people I've worked with previously also jumped in quite early to help me put some structure around it. So now we are a team of close to 20. Um, there is an advisory board in place who are helping us to align with the, the principles of not-for-profits and charities to make sure that it's sort of, you know, people's money is put to the right place and we make an impact. Um, and we've had to learn as we go then. We've um, been inundated. We set up a form on our, our site for suppliers. So at the time, I mean, it feels like a long time ago, but people were unsure whether they'd be staying open through the week, let alone, you know, for the duration of the emergency. And um, it was a sense that if you were still open and still interested in providing, you know, food, especially if you were a dine-in moving to takeout or you were in a, a part of the sector badly hit, you know, get on the form, let us know where you are. And, and we'll try our best to, to get to as many of you as possible. Within about five days, we 300 plus suppliers sign up across the country. Um, we've been working through that to try and find matches between that and all of the inbound information we're getting. So those headlines that you're seeing, I think is no different to people in the service when they're off uh, are seeing them. And they're DMing us, they're emailing us, they're letting us know where they are across the response. And I guess one of the things that maybe I naively thought at the start of this was, you know, the, the pictures of, of hospital doctors, that that was the response. But the response is a full system wide emergency response. There is people, you know, who are volunteering to go back into service to man the um, testing units, the drive through tests. The National Ambulance Service are obviously responsible for a huge amount. The Dublin Fire Brigade paramedic crews are doing the Dublin region. Uh, you have the people being redeployed from other parts of the public sector to do contact tracing in office blocks across the country. You know, we wouldn't ordinarily look at them, those spaces, and think that's a, a sort of a vital pillar of the national response. So the incoming uh, information we get is that we see everything uh, that's going on, and they're quite quick to put their hand up and let us know where they are so that we can make sure that they're covered. A lot of these people are donating or dedicating 16 hour days, 12 and 16 hour days. It's not always guaranteed that they'd be able to you know, have a meal during that. We're asking them to do this for 15 and 16 weeks. So I think it just resonated. There's a, something very Irish about just feeding people out of gratitude. And I think it sort of resonated with a public who's sitting at home as a, a positive contribution they can make. And 12 to 16 hours, you mentioned there, Keen. Um, I'd imagine your own days are pretty long at the moment. Are you <laughs> yeah. trying to ju juggle this and safe facility or has there been um, a wind down that I suppose half the country is experiencing at this point? How are things in the other business? I think I think fundamentally uh, we are in a business that will not get decisions until the emergency is over. So our core business is in, is in building, is in uh, safety, but it requires a uh, sign off from a number of parts of, a, of, a, of an organisation. Um, I think it's very clear that everybody has moved to a, a, an essential services footing. If you're not an essential service, it's very unlikely you're going to be committing you know, purchases and sales. And even the idea of executing on manufacturing and putting crews on sites, all of that is up in the air. So, yeah, we are on pause. Um, we're very much in a sort of cash hoarding phase to make sure that we can sustain ourselves through the uh, duration the staff who work with me, the team, have been uh, incredible, um, incredibly patient as well. Um, and we have a plan in place that should get us through the other side. I mean, I still believe we have a great product and you, you kind of have to do your best to make sure that you're alive at the other side of this. And that's different for every business. And it's probably maybe a little easier for us to say than for companies that are dependent on week to week cash flow from over the counter sales or even through your e-shop. Uh, we were in a slightly more... Um, lucky position, I guess, that this happened when it did. We were in the position to take a decision to stay going for, for the next while uh, uh, without huge amounts of, of pain. But there are other people for whom that's not the case. I remember you saying to me the last time you were with us that, uh, which like, I'm trying to remember <laughs> when, when that even was now, but um, I remember you, you called it quite early in terms of the coronavirus and things were just kicking off at that point. And you said that you anticipated um, that supply chains were going to go down 
uh, globally um, pretty quick um, for anything, for especially hardware. Did that happen? Yeah, uh, we we started getting emails not long after that on extended lead times. I, I think I think that's probably gotten worse if you're not in the production of of safety equipment or ventilators. I think you're seeing as well uh, the pivot of conventional manufacturing in most countries toward making PPE, making ventilators, making vital equipment. So those supply chains are now under huge strain. So you have where you had maybe uh, a set of demands you now have 10x that demand globally. So those supply chains are under huge pressure. And then if you're not making anything that's essential to that, uh, that economic activity has grown to a halt in many cases. So yeah, we've seen huge delays. Um, I, I suspect that it's going to take three to six months post uh, emergency for things to return to something resembling normal. And that's assuming demand is still there at the other side. Well, I suppose regardless of when the emergency ends, you're going to be kept pretty busy in the yeah. meantime. Um, is the money is the money still coming in? How much is there at the moment? Uh, yeah. Enough to keep you going for a while, I'd, I'd say. We've 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 five hundred and twenty five thousand raised to date, um, and we do. I mean, it's over eleven thousand donors, so it's it's an enormous uh, public response to this. It's a, it's a national response in a sense. Um, we have enough to keep us going through the end of this we won't be around post-emergency. The plan is to continue to uh, plug gaps as they're arising to make sure that that people who put their hand up are, are in a position to get something and that we um, are able to to basically spend this money down during the during the emergency. Um, I think we're able to go definitely until the middle of May, end of May, which I think will coincide, we hope, looking at the projections with the, the, de, the decrease side of the peak. Uh, and if we can meet that on the way down, I think we'll have done our job and, and grateful to public for supporting us doing it. And do you get any particular requests with donations? Um, you know, I want to donate this much, but I want to make sure it feeds uh, people in Letterkenny General Hospital or that type of thing. You know what? I'm surprised. I mean, I, I grew up in rural Ireland, so I'd be familiar with the perception that they all get everything up in Dublin. Um, and you know what? We didn't actually. There's maybe been a, a very small number who would like to know or be reassured that this is a, a nationwide coverage. But I think everyone's really the, the the reading through the comments on the GoFundMe. Everyone's m major sentiment is gratitude. I guess we all know uh, people in the service. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have family members who are in the HSE. Um, but I think everyone has friends, family, or loved ones, and we know that they're quite self-sacrificing um, in normal times. And in the last four weeks, they've been asked to ex exceed the the sacrifice, double it down, and they've all done it. And they're taking, you know, substantial risks. You know, a quarter of the cases confirmed to date are healthcare workers. So everyone who has experience of them is is quite acutely aware of the risk they're putting themselves in. So primarily, everyone is saying, um, keep it keep it up. Make sure they know that we're thanking them. Um, and one or two are kind of saying, make sure to get out to the regions. But we are. We've delivered from Letterkenny to Cork and from Castlebar across to Dublin. So it is a national spread, and we're very conscious that this is a national a national movement. And, oh, and and the disease doesn't respect any borders anyway. True, true. Um, and, and when you mentioned earlier, you get uh, DMs from suppliers. So is it a case that, um, let's say you have um, a supplier who wants to be involved in Bantry or Kenmare, and then you kind of cross-check, okay, where is the nearest uh, HSE centre that, you know, where, where are the nearest people who need this? Yeah near yeah. Bantry and Kemmer. is that how it works that's 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 it's as unscientific as that it's 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 uh <laughs> it's simple. It, this is it yeah we'll get one it'll either be a hands up from a, a group that are working a, a contact center or maybe a covid center or the hospital or it'll be a supplier and it'll be an effort to match up you know re, what can we reasonably um deliver to this group or what can we reasonably ask this supplier to do um and look there, the the reality is there are some people in the list who are just uh, we can't find a fit and there is just a difficulty there where there isn't anything nearby that that really meets the need yet. But that need is constantly changing. So the list is a huge resource for us even into the future. And when the lockdown officially happened, Kian, that must have put a strain on things for you because suddenly, uh, you know, even in terms of making those matches with suppliers, um, you presumably have to stick with what, two kilometres now. So how did that affect things? Yeah, so um, 
we've been anticipating from early on that the next stage in it was going to be a, a much stricter uh, interpretation of, of staying at home. And we anticipated, um, I suppose, people will be familiar with our social and see that there's quite a lot of branded uh, restaurants and takeaways that, that are part of our, our movement. Um, we anticipated, though, that it, things were going to probably get a little tougher with lockdown restrictions for those and had been working as well with dedicated kitchens, commercial kitchens, to prepare uh, meals on a, on a daily basis going into specific areas. Um, and we'd been building that capacity in the two weeks leading up to the lockdown announcement. So when it came, uh, we were in a position to check around to the uh, number who were doing daily drops to make sure that they were in a in a position to to continue as essential and that they were willing to do so. I think the main thing is there's no obligations here because it's voluntary, um, but they were all happy to continue going. Uh, and when we saw the guidelines the following day, you could clearly see that the food for essential services was covered under the regs. So we were in a position to keep going. I think it's probably a little difficult for, for some of our restaurant partners because their staff as well may have have you know, concerns and it may have, and we saw in the first two or three days, um, some make the call to close and to take the two week period themselves. Others are, are continuing to trade. And I think that's a very kind of specific decision to each business. You know, it can be as, as, as basic as what your kitchen shape is, is in order to get your business done and whether you can sustain it or not. So yeah, it was a big disruption, but we had kind of put the planning in place for the week in advance to be able to, to continue through it. And as you know, Saturday morning, after the announcement, we were still delivering uh, 31 drops on on, this, on that Saturday. Um, right. 15 or 16 of those had already been, you know, committed on a daily basis to people that need them. Obviously, since it's voluntary, um, you know, people can, it's up to people themselves if they want to stay involved in changing times, as you said. But um, is there an onus on you then with sending, uh, sending delivery people, I suppose, into into maybe uh, the most dangerous places they could go for this into hospitals and then equally, yeah. you know, the cross contamination effect of if they're dealing with um, frontline staff who themselves are, are so much more at risk. How did you handle that or did you have any advice so on both sides? Yeah, we're very conscious of that. Um, the first decision we made was to, to stick with established professionals. So individuals who are experienced in this business, both in the cooking and the delivering, they'll have had the regulation they have registered kitchens and they have their own sort of delivery teams. So at least then there's an established structure, pattern and experience, and they are aware of all of the new guidelines. Uh, the second thing is that we coordinate quite heavily with the people that are on the receiving end. We have relationships and, and there are certain uh, areas of the health system where, where we can't just sort of send in, you know, 15 pizzas. You know, they won't be accepted. Um, so we're working with those and we have created areas. There are certain uh, delivery, obviously the deliveries have to be done contact free, you know, many of the operators, even for your own takeaway, are now doing contact free delivery. So that as a practice has been rolled out across the industry. Um, you have social distancing, you know, at handover. Uh, packaging and food packaging, the HSE do have a recommendation that that, that is safe and there isn't a, a, a ev enough evidence that there is a, a risk from, from the food packaging per se. So what we are doing is we coordinate, we make sure that everyone is comfortable. We try and make it as uh, distant as possible to do handovers and we do the handovers in bulk. Um, but again, it's it's if there are any issues, people are not afraid to, to sort of put up their hand. And I think everyone is aware that as soon as it's not right for them, uh, that's absolutely fine. And we appreciate everything everyone's done to date. And finally, Keen, you mentioned you have some family members um, on the front lines yourself. Uh, how are things there? Everybody safe and well? Thankfully, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably harder for the people who aren't going in every day um, to kind of because it's constantly in the back of your mind. But they are they are safe and well, thankfully, and they are uh, in a position to um, to keep fighting. Um, it's an intense time. I think, you know, I can only imagine what it's like when you're seeing your your work environment restructured into, you know, something similar to what we see in City West. It's quite a jarring image when you just see rows of beds. You know, it's sort of something from a World War Two movie. So, you know, there's there's an enormous amount of 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 um, change. And uh, I think it's just a very difficult time and a huge amount of stress and pressure. And as I say, I think the recovery period from this will actually be quite, quite intense and quite long, um, irrespective of, of 
quite how high that peak goes. I think there's already significant sort of strains that have been put on people that, that we'll have to look at at the end of this. Well, hopefully it'll wrap up, as you say, yeah. around May, but you, you might be kept busy far beyond that, Ian. <laughs> yeah, we'll maybe, maybe. <laughs> Well, listen, thanks so much for being with us. And um, I will I'll continue to enjoy reading all those Keanu Flaherty Feed the Heroes headlines. <laughs> and uh, you might find it jarring to go back to Keanu Flaherty Safe Facility CEO after all this. You might get quite used do. to Feed the Heroes. I, I think I think there'll probably be a, a relish in getting back to normal at the same time. But I appreciate that everyone has just taken this to their hearts. It's been quite a privilege to be, uh, for all of us, to be at the centre of a, such a, an outrush of generosity uh, and gratitude. It's been really nice to ride that wave in a, in a troubling time. Well, we're glad we have you facilitating yeah. and keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. We'll talk soon. Thanks a million. Well, that's it from us for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to AIB for backing the show. And thanks to my guests, Keno Flaherty, Ashling Tayar, and Dr. Mally Coyne. We will, of course, be back next week. In the meantime, don't forget to hit subscribe to get the full show on podcast and YouTube. See you next week. Mm-hmm.